All right, uh, this is Free Alabama Movement. We'll continue with our video series. I'm going to introduce y'all to some more people in the room, and we're going to hear some more stories. Uh, as we said, these are real-life stories. These are not urban novels. These are not stage plays. These are people telling you their circumstances and uh, people who have been rehabilitated, people that we know around the prison. And, you know, they're just doing dead time, and we continue to ask ourselves every day, you know, why are we still in prison? We, we, we've got the uh, rehabilitation. We've got the education. Uh, other than the free labor, other than exploiting our families, why are we still in prison? Uh, let me get you to say your name, sir. And my name is Maude. All right. Mr. Cook over there. Henry Cook. Brother Cook Bates. Brother Cook Bates. Uh, Mr. Smart, where are you from? Dallas, Maude, uh, how much? How long you been incarcerated now? Ten years. Ten years. Uh, or what kind of sentence you got? Life without parole. Life without parole. So basically you understand that the state is saying that there's nothing else can be done for Mr. Smart. Uh, he can't be any type of, he has nothing positive to offer inside of prison. And that's based on something that you were convicted of 10 years ago. Correct. So how old were you when you caught your case? Um, about 29. 29. So how old are you today? 39. 39. How do you feel about having a life sentence at 39 for something that you were convicted of when you were 29? And knowing that the way that the system is currently structured, uh, your opportunities for release are very slim, and the avenues for rehabilitation are basically non-existent. How does that feel? Um, I feel very frustrated, um, painful, um, feel humiliated, um, frustrated all the time, um, around the clothes of the body. Um, I'm in a very dangerous situation here in the jail, so. I'm not in a safe space at all. So, without any incentive or motivation to do anything positive, how do you remain positive, uh, even in light of your circumstance? Well, um, I practice and exercise my spirituality to try to keep me focused, um, try to keep a positive attitude. Talk to other inmates that have a positive attitude, um, um, but even sometimes they go through their own frustrations. Mm -hmm. They go through their own challenges in here in the big show. Right. Uh, does the state offer anything? Do you do you regularly, with your sentence, do you regularly see the psychologist? Do, do they offer social service programs? Do you regularly see a classification specialist? How does that work? Um, I see no one. No one talks to me. Um, no, I don't get no six-month um, classification report. Um, I don't see any counselors. Um, so no one sit down and talk to me about my condition. Um, I'm just safe here. Um, like I say, sir, in the life without the road. Uh, can you be rehabilitated? Uh, or what were the problems that you had before you were incarcerated? Tell us what, 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 I mean, why do they feel like nothing can be done with you? Tell us what, 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 what can, what can you offer? Um, <clears throat> well, what I do offer is, um, well, um, the way I was raised, I was raised to have respect for other people mm -hmm. and um, also, you know, demand respect back if necessary. Uh, do they offer you education? Do you have a high school diploma or anything like that? No, they don't offer me any of that. Actually, I tried to sign up for a GED program. Um, um, I was denied. Because of your sin? Yes. So they're not even going to allow you to attempt to rehabilitate yourself? No. They won't allow me any school, trade. No life skills courses? No drug program. Uh, no psychological uh, review. It's just simply they're saying they they don't want to waste any money on you, but you're saying you want these things. Yes, I you, need these things. You understand right? that you need these things? Yes, but they won't offer the acceptance. Well... Free Alabama Movement, I don't know how much you know about it, but it's a uh, movement supporting the nonviolent and peaceful protests of prisoners for civil and human rights. Uh, we're seeking to address uh, the living conditions. Uh, we want to address the exploitation of inmates through free labor, and we're also addressing sentencing and parole reform. And one of the things about our movement is we want to draft legislation that will not even consider what a person sentence is, but what a person's ability to be rehabilitated is. And we want to enroll people in our program and give them the therapies that they need. If you have a robbery case, you get anger management, uh, criminal thinking, 
or if you don't have a GED, you get that. If you don't have a skill of trade, you get that. Or if you don't have life skills for it, you know, just basic functions in society, computer classes, uh, contracting with a person who owns an apartment building, uh, the light company, the gas company, things that you need in society. We want to offer all those things to get people prepared. Uh, do you think a program like that will work, and would a program like that work for you? Yes, it will most definitely work for me, but it's only this year. Right. Would you be willing to make sacrifices and support the Free Alabama Movement to make those changes so that we can bring those type of changes to the system? I love to participate. All right. Well, we appreciate you for your time and the interview, and you know we're going to be around, and uh, we're going to continue to document for the people that, you know, we got a lot of Jermaine Smarts, a lot of people in prison who want to be rehabilitated, who want education, and want an opportunity to go back home, but continue to be denied it simply because of the sentence they have uh, for something that he may or may not have done 10 years ago. You know, but irregardless of that, we still have a human being here who's capable of being redeemed and wants to be redeemed, but is being deprived of the opportunity. And that's what we feel like is unfair within the system. And that's why we are protesting, and that's why we're calling our families uh, to come to the prisons when we call the movement to march with us, to stand outside and candlelight visits for people like Jermaine Smart. Uh, next, we're going to go over to Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook, I'm going to get you to come over here and have a seat. I want to ask you a few questions. Cook. You, okay. on the left. You next, uh, Cook. Man. How you doing today, sir? All right. How you? All right. Uh, now, we already had talked about it. I know you got a life sentence, but just, just give us some background as far as your education, where you come from, and how old you are. I'm 54 years old. Uh, Mobile. Okay. Be a 30 years uh, 1977 to two, 2007. Okay. I got out in 2007, 2008. I was rearrested for a third degree domestic violence. Third degree domestic violence. Now I want y'all to pay real close attention to this. You can go to Mobile County, you can verify the arrest record. This is a man who did 30 years in prison. Uh, he was arrested. A year later after his release for domestic violence, but take a t pay attention to what happened to him after his domestic violence arrest. Okay, Mr. Cook. After I was taken to the precinct, uh -huh. I was later charged with three first degree armed robbery and capital murder. Okay. I was set by to limestone. All right. Why at limestone, my state appointed attorney pled me out to life without parole. I had no knowledge of it. So when I go back to Mobile, to my arrangement, I was told by Judge Tory Scratch mm -hmm. that I already had life without what I was doing back. Okay. And I told him that was impossible because I ain't signed any papers agreeing to that. So you were in prison at Limestone back on the violation. Right. And they already, your lawyer already done sold you out before you even go to right. court. And the sold job for life without parole, and you don't know nothing about it. Right. Okay, now finish, finish with the conversation. So, after that, I told my lawyer, I said, hey, man, it's impossible for me to have life without when I ain't signed no paper. Mm -hmm. They sent me back to the metro. Okay. Two weeks later, they bring me back over and tell me I no longer have the life without. Okay. But it was on the side. So if I wanted to fight the true robbery, that. If I lose either or, I would would receive that life without a union. So he already threatening you and trying to intimidate right. you into taking a life sentence and, and instead of exercising your constitutional rights to go to trial and prove your innocence. Right. So okay. I asked my lawyer, did he have any possible chance? He told me he wasn't getting paid to represent me and fight for me. He okay. was getting paid to get me the best deal possible. Okay. So I need to take that life sentence. So what happened to the capital murder charge? What would they do right there? They dismissed it because they said they didn't have enough evidence to support it. Uh, how long How long were you charged with capital murder before they did that? Um, like I said, I got arrested April the 19th okay. of 2008. Okay. This was like in uh, December when they had dismissed it and everything. Okay, well, let me take you back to the first 30 years that you served. Uh, how much time did you have when you had that 30 years? I had 50. 50 years, so you did 30 years on 50. on 50. Um, 
slides. This, uh, how, how did you get out? Well, you know, it's basic. Okay, so you had earned good time. Right. All right. Well, did you get the GED in them 30 years? Well, I was, I was fortunate enough to uh, attend school. Okay. Before I came. To okay, prison. so you had your diploma before right. you came to prison. Okay. Well, when you were in prison, did you get a skill of trade? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. I, I have uh, four skills. You got four skills in the 30 years that you were, were locked up? Uh, welding, regulation, auto mechanics, and food service. So why did you have to do 30 years if you did all those things to prepare yourself? Well, like I said, the system is, was so violent to me. Uh-huh. You know, a young guy coming through, like the Baron said earlier, uh -huh. you had to like, stand your ground or you was going to be punked out. Uh-huh. Out just on my menu. Yeah, well, what you were cut out for, you had to be a man. Yeah, with no other choice. And they hold that against you when you go up for parole. Quite naturally. But they know that the system preys on young kids. Right. Okay. And it's no different these days. The okay. system is still preying on young kids. But in order for this young system to be become any better, it's going to take people from the outside to help us. Uh -huh. Because we're not getting any help in here. So right. Administration. Right. And guys in prison have to stick together. we got to help ourselves, too. You know. Okay. Well, Mr. Cook, I do appreciate your time. My battery running low, so we're going to get Brother Cook Bay in for just a few minutes. Okay. And we're going to continue yeah. these interviews. Hey, I appreciate you sharing that with us, man. Thanks. And uh, I know you got more to offer. Free Alabama Movement. We'll be I back around. Thank All you. Right. Come on, Brother Cook Bay. How you doing, Brother Cook Bay? Uh, uh, please state your name for us if you don't mind. My name is John Irvin Cook. Okay, where you from, bro? Southeast Alabama. Right, and, uh, how long you been incarcerated now? 23 years. Uh, what kind of sentence you got? Locked without parole. Locked without parole. And uh, what do you do in the prison? You currently work in the kitchen? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, how long you been working in the kitchen? 18 years. You been working in the kitchen 18 years? Yes, sir. And in them 18 years, how much have they paid you for 18 years worth of labor? Nothing. You never got paid for all the work you done in the kitchen? Nothing. Man. And the living conditions? Well, no, nah, before we talk about that, tell us about the kitchen. Tell us what it's like inside the kitchen. The kitchen basically is like working in a sewer. Uh, give us some detail, because I done heard some stories about rats and roaches. There's, there's the kitchen. I work. I go to work in the morning time about 1.30. Okay. I work in the dish room, and when you go in and you see the lights on, the walls are covered with cockroaches. Would you be willing to um, take some pictures and video footage for us so that we can show the people that, you know, you're not exaggerating right. the lies? Sure, I would. All right. Um, and what did you? Uh, what is the crime you locked up for? Capital murder. Capital murder. How old were you? Were you when you caught that offense? Twenty-five. Twenty-five years old. Uh, what were the circumstances? Was it more than one victim, or just one? Victim. Just one victim. And what made it a capital offense? Well, it said it was basically a robbery with a Fargo truck. And someone got killed. Right. And um, what? Well, give me some history on your background. Did you graduate high school? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, where did you, uh, did you go to college? No, sir. Uh, do you have any skills or trade? No, sir. So, once you came, well, you already showed potential just by graduating high school. So, even though you made a mistake, was that your first felony conviction? Well, basically, when I came when I was going to high school, okay. I was still in this part of the illiterate state that just passed me through. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Tell us about illiteracy as far as uh, being in prison. Uh, how much illiteracy? They say that 80% of the people in prison are illiterate. So tell us about the illiteracy rate in prison. Yeah. Okay, okay. Get that on because that was my uh, uh, Okay, tell us about that. Well, basically, now I'm at the point right now where I can't read in right now. Okay. And through the years of being incarcerated, having a desire to, to 
to learn how to read and write. Okay. You know, and I basically learned from having books like Robert, you know, that stood by my side. Okay, we just said, go ahead. Wouldn't, 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 let me, wouldn't let me get away uh -huh. or just run around and not know how to read and write. Okay. And so, in you getting this education, even though you know you got a life without sin, even though you know that that um that may you may not be released from prison, you still took the initiative to educate yourself exactly. because you want to be educated. Right. Even though the state, do you understand by giving you life without the state was saying really that you couldn't even be educated. Exactly. Basically, they were saying that I was that I was non-productive to society. Right. But you, but at the same time. They can use you to work in their kitchen. Exactly. So just as you can work in that kitchen, you can work for Red Lobster. Yes. Exactly. You'll work for McDonald's. You know, I'm at the point right now to where I can, I'm at the state where I can manage, I can manage to run my own business. Okay. But you're not going to be afforded that opportunity that they ain't saying right now. No. Um, just, um, I mean, tell us. And tell us about the conditions that you have to serve your time under. Tell us about that. Very, very, you know, poor. Uh huh. You know, uh, as far as my, as far as advancing my education wise, you know, I'm not able to do that. All right. You know. Because of your sin. Exactly. Because of something that you did. How many years ago? Twenty-three years ago. Twenty-three years ago, but they can't. And they don't evaluate you today. They don't know who you are today. Basically, no, because they look at me for when I first came right. to prison and I was on high patrol medication. And Did your lawyer know that? No. He didn't try to find out anything about what you had going on? No. Did you have a trial? Yes. So you went to trial and you were found guilty of capital murder by jury? Well, basically, I was, I was coerced. So you pled guilty. Yes. So you had a lawyer that convinced you that your best out was to plead right. guilty to a life without sin. Right. Okay. Um, uh, man, man, that's a that's a tough one, there, man. But you know, uh, free Alabama movement. Those are the type of issues we want to address because, you know, even though you got a life without for a murder robbery, another person can commit a robbery and get out of prison and then commit a murder. And they won't have a capital murder option. Right. But you do because yours happened at the same time. But even so, you still not afforded the opportunity to rehabilitate yourself. But you are saying that you can be rehabilitated and you've shown rehabilitation. Most definitely. So, um, knowing these things about Free Alabama Movement, do you feel like Free Alabama Movement can help you? Most definitely. Would you support Free Alabama Movement? If I was my heart, my body, and soul. All right, well, we appreciate you sharing your story with us and giving us insight into what's going on inside the kitchen. And uh, we look forward to working with you because we want people to see uh, how, how our food is prepared. You right. know, we want them to see the circumstances under which it's prepared. We want them to see that these people just don't give a damn about people in prison. All right. All right. And um, we'll be getting back with you. I appreciate it. Okay. King of the West. Well, man. Uh, they just brought AIDS cases in the prison. You been educated on the test? No. How about you, Cook, Bray? They, uh, no. How about you, Brother Cook? No. You received your education on AIDS cases? No. Uh, do you know if the person you sleep in the cell with is an AIDS patient? I don't know. Could be. How about you? Do you know? Could be. No. So what type of precautions can you take? Uh, we heard Brother the Baron Craig earlier say that they don't even supply cleaning supplies for once a month and that we can't keep them in our cell. So... How do you keep an environment clean like that? It's really kind of hard because you don't know how to really prepare yourself for it. I mean, yeah, you know, we all conscious of where AIDS is, you know, and we don't know how to prepare ourselves or we don't know how to really read the signs. And you see all kinds of healthy people with it. And, yeah. You know, so we don't know how to really read the signs and know that, man, he got it. So we got right. to steer clear of him. Well, it's not so much that we need to steer clear of him. We just need to be aware because... A lot of times, we're the ones that have to break the fights up around here. Right. You know what I'm saying? We're the ones, we play sports and we rub shoulders and mingle with each other. Uh, when we have problems, we get to fighting with each other. 
And when that blood gets dispersed, it ain't going to pick and choose on, you know, who right. who, who can be affected by it. Right. And then it's already disease is spreading around. So if a guy just decides, if you, if, 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 if let's just give your, something. if a guy worked in the kitchen right. and wanted to go in there and do something that could affect a lot of people, how, how easy would it be for him to do? Super easy. I mean, so he could just contaminate the juice. Exactly. Uh, the juice, the, uh. Just whatever, you know, we don't even know, see, and that's the thing about when you're not educated about these things. We don't even know if a person can do that. You know, all we can do is speculate. Can he contaminate the juice? We don't know. Can the food be contaminated? We don't know. Can we catch it off of the toilet? If this is a person that engages in homosexual activity and uh, they have uh, blood or something coming out of their rectum, can the traces of that if a person sits down and they got a rash and they sit on the toilet behind that person, can they catch that disease? You know, how susceptible are we to catching this disease? We don't know, and they're supposed to educate us, but we haven't, uh, we haven't been educated yet. They so. can't can discriminate against AIDS cases, but they discriminate against us because we don't, we don't know who they are. Right. And, and we want to, you know, they're not even in position to inform us inform us of who's who. Right. So, you know, our life is basically just okay. in the air. Just in the air. Yeah. And won't even educate us about, so you got people nervous and because we aren't informed because we don't really know right. what we can and can't do. Right. You know, basically, the people who, it's really like this, mind the people who put in position to supervise us really don't care about our situation. Right. They main thing is they got a job to provide for they folks. Exactly. They come at home every day. Exactly. They don't really care about how we live and what we going through in here. You know, just like the man said, many times we breaking up fights. When the man fall out, we had to pick him up right. and take him to that fight. Right. We mm -hmm. doing all this. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they really, basically we rehabilitate ourselves. We governing ourselves. Right. Right. All they do is just come in and get three months. And do the exactly. count. That's it. The only thing they got to do is make sure the counselor. That's it. I'd like to say something, too. Uh -huh. um, I seen an inmate get stabbed up two days ago. And um, one was laying out on the ground. Mm -hmm. Stabbed him. Two inmates picked him up and covered him like he was bleeding. Mm -hmm. They had no gloves on to protect them. Yeah, and uh, the nursing staff, they don't come out into the general population. Oh, no, no. You got to be transported to, exactly. the, to the hospital the best way you can get there. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, you yourself have had some experiences with police brutality inside the prison. Uh, Free Alabama Movement profiles uh, police brutality, threats, intimidation, abuse of authority. And uh, Mr. Smart, was a, uh, he's going to give us a, 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 a personal account of that abuse, if you would, please. Yes, um, I had um altercation with an officer um, when I was facing lockup. Okay. And um, during the time and period I was doing my um, stay time to lock up. The officer threatened me, told me when I get out of lock up, I'll be right back. So when I got out of lock up, the officer approached me on a pet search. So when the officer pet searched me and um, I stripped, he told me to strip. I stripped butt naked and I had no contraband. Okay. And I was angry about it because he did it to humiliate me. Right, he didn't right. He do it out of good faith. Right. So did he do it out in the open? Because we done seen guys be yeah, stripped up in, in front of a whole block. Yes, I and had so, to get butt naked in front of a lot of different other inmates. And he knows what kind of environment we in, all type of sexual right. predators and, right. and yeah. just, you know, purveyors and people of that nature. So he did this. And then what happened next? Afterwards, I was angry about it. Then the officer had some words about it. The officer left. He came back again. And when he came back again, he told me to come out the cell to go to the tip office. Okay. So when I stepped out my cell to go to the tip office, I was surrounded by four officers. Okay. And when the officers surrounded me, they told me to turn around and face the wall. But I didn't because I seen ill will in their face. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I thought I was going to the tip office to talk to the supervisor. So when I went and turned around, I was attacked by the officers. And when the officers attacked me, they end up putting me back in lock. Okay, so he kept his promise that when you get out, you're coming right back. Yes. Uh, was there any paperwork done on that, or 
Yeah. There's a form. I, I've never seen them do it at this prison, but when a uh, violent incident occurs, you're supposed to sign a form, a statement of a violent incident. Did they uh, afford you an opportunity to do that? Well, um, they um, gave me a disciplinary report. They wrote me up. <laughs> um, Assault on all? No, they um, charged me with disciliary violence. Okay, okay, okay. But other than that, uh, even though you alleged that force was used against you unnecessarily, they did not offer you a use of force statement and afford you an opportunity to uh, explain that. No, they did not. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to end our interview series today. We had to stop a couple of times for the count, and uh, we got some police moving around in the building, and uh, we want to be able to continue to profile these living conditions and uh, profile these real stories of these people and uh, continue to let people know that, you know, there are human beings inside the prison who are capable of being redeemed and who want to get out of prison and uh, just not being afforded opportunities. Uh, this is Free Alabama Movement, Free Alabama Movement.